Hi, I'm Weston. Today's scripture is Luke 1, 39-45. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Georgian town in the hill country where she entered the house of Zechariah and I greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and sprang with a loud cry. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me? As the mother of my Lord comes to me. For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed it she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. We the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Merry Christmas! Yes, Weston is definitely a little ball of energy and joy as well. I, I'm sure it was entertaining trying to follow him with a microphone with stuff like that. But entertain, entertain. Yeah, yeah, uh huh, yeah. Well. I, I've loved our connection with Brady. It's a neat little community, and I love the ways that we get to support them and work with them as well. And it's also special to me because I grew up in a small town, and, and I know some of those experiences. Weston may just be a name on a screen to us, but I assure you everybody in Brady knows who Weston is, right? Growing up in Mullen, I, I heard plenty of these small town sayings and jokes, like how you hear in a small town you can't get away with anything because before you get home, your parents will probably know about it. Sometimes that was true as well. In Mullen, I, I remember when I grew up, growing up, I had a t-shirt that said, where in the world is Mullen, Nebraska on the front? And on the back it said, between Seneca and Hecla. <laughs> now some of you laugh because you know where those towns are. People in Kearney didn't get it at all. I, I even remember a little homemade sign that someone had that said, Mullen, Nebraska, four places to buy beer, five places to repent from it. <laughs> the thing is, we, we pick on small towns sometimes, and yet I know some of the best pieces of who I am come from those small town experiences. It turns out Elizabeth understood that as well. <laughs> she came from a small town. It says in our scripture today, when Mary went to visit Elizabeth, it just says she went to a Judean town in the hill country. I've always found it fascinating that, that this little town is so insignificant, so to speak, that they never even record its name in scripture. Only God doesn't care about places, the location, or the status. God cares about our willingness. God can do incredible things through unlikely places and unlikely people. That's why this Advent season, our series, has been Unlikely Heroes. All of the different people who make up important pieces of this story. We started out the season talking about Zechariah, Elizabeth's husband. But the more I looked at these stories, the more I was convinced Elizabeth needed a week of her own as well. Do you ever notice how angelic visits seem to be kind of the norm in the Christmas story? Mary gets a visit, Joseph gets a visit, Zechariah gets a visit, and of course the shepherds on that Christmas Eve. But most times God doesn't send a message that's quite so obvious. I mean, the heavenly beings give us a, a sense of wonder and awe in the Christmas story, but some of the more subtle signs are just as significant and maybe more, more relatable. 
In today's text, we pick up right after Mary has had her angelic visit. And immediately, it says, with haste, she goes to see Elizabeth. As the angel's talking to her in verse 36, the angel told Mary, And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for she who is said to be barren. Now, some translations say that they are cousins. I'm not sure that's maybe the best translation. But whatever their connection is, I am convinced it's way deeper than DNA. I mean, in some ways, it's like they're in very different places. Elizabeth is elderly, too old, they think, to have a child. And Mary is young, too young to be a mom. The Bible says she's a virgin. Now, in the biblical times, that word may have had a little different meaning. Some scholars will suggest it, it's really just saying that she's young. I think both versions are true. But the beauty of this story, I think, is, is that these women become an incredible support system for each other. They encourage one another, speak life into each other. That's important because Scripture isn't just the story of what happened. It's a reminder of who we're called to be. And like these women, the gift of God isn't just something we receive. It's something we are called to give as well. I know, maybe Mary went to confirm this story she heard from the angel, but I think it's more than that. I mean, she's just received the most incredible and intimidating news of her short life. I mean, think about it. Isn't it crazy? This teenage girl has just found out she's pregnant, and she doesn't run to talk to her friend. She doesn't want to go talk to mom. She sets out to go visit this elderly woman, Elizabeth. Pastor Matthew Kratz writes, Mary would share her wonderful news with Elizabeth, confident she was the one person Mary could count on to believe her story. We get it. I mean, the miracle of immaculate conception is kind of a, a staple in the Christmas story. But if someone were to come share that with us today, we'd have our doubts. Other people would have heard this story and, and maybe they would have thought, well, this is just some far-fetched tale she made up to cover up her sexual immorality. But not Elizabeth. She knows God can do anything because she's experienced it herself. This year I was so intrigued in the timeline that comes with this story. It's one of the reasons I, I love Scripture is it doesn't matter how many times we've read it before, God can show us something new. I mentioned in, in verse 36 it says that Elizabeth is in her sixth month. And if we keep reading, you get to verse 56 where it says, And Mary remained with her about three months and then returned home. Now, I admit math is not my strongest suit, but six plus three, I can do that. It's nine months, right? I wonder. You think Mary was there when Joseph, or I mean, when John was born? Do you think it's possible that she got to hold the messenger before she gave birth to the Messiah? I wonder this... This young woman, a virgin, do you think she, she's so young she had never experienced seeing someone give birth? Was this the opportunity she had to see Elizabeth go through it, to, to understand what was going to happen? Was this what gave this young mom the bravery to have a baby in a manger? It's intriguing to think about. Whatever the reasoning, what, whatever the rationale for the visit, it must have been the most emotional and intimidating moment of her life. And Mary knows the one person she can count on is Elizabeth. 
And as soon as she walks in the door, God gives this amazing miracle moment. Verse 41, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Sorry, I can't quite do it the way Weston does. He, he has a lot of leaped energy there, right? I mean, how, how cool is that moment? You know, Mary's been told who this child will be. Zechariah was told that, that the Christ child, the Messiah, was coming. But it's this unborn child who leapt with joy. The first to truly worship the Messiah. As far as we know, Elizabeth hasn't had any prophetic dreams, no visits from angels, but the child inside her responds, and she knows. Then in in verses 42 and 43, she proclaims, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? Talk about a confidence boost for this scared young woman, Mary. (laughs) Is this all real? Is this this really happening? Can I do this? And then Elizabeth speaks. And all her doubts disappear. What? What an amazing moment. What an important and an often overlooked piece in our Christmas story. I mean, I think sometimes we read Scripture and and we feel like it's unrelatable. I mean, angelic visits, immaculate conception, those are not part of our everyday stories. But if we just read Scripture to think about what happened, we, we miss the message that's still coming today. And I think, I think we have so many lessons we can learn from Elizabeth's story. And one of those is that, that God is still speaking to us and through us. I mean, God uses the unlikeliest people in the most unexpected times, in these obscure places, to do the most amazing things. Have you ever noticed in Scripture that that God rarely calls the rich and the powerful, rarely calls those the world would say are successful? God calls the least, the lost, the nobody from nowhere, and uses them to change the world. It seems it's often in the barren places God does some of his bigness miracles. But I wonder sometimes if we still believe that today. I mean, do we really believe that the God of the universe is speaking to us? I admit I, I sometimes struggle to hear the voice of God. I wish I was more tuned in to that still, small voice. I've often teased that that my wife can hear that sweet, small voice of God, and, and he has to speak to me with a baseball bat. I mean, if it is not obvious, I did not see it. Like when I decided that I I was going to go back to seminary, for me it was this huge revelation moment. I'm like, oh, this is so cool. And I go to all my friends and family to tell them, like, this is exciting. They're not going to know this. And all of them are like, yeah, I knew that. We knew you were called to ministry. Why didn't anybody tell me? And they're like, we did. (laughs) I missed it. It reminds me of the the words of the great theologian A.W. Tozer. God is speaking. He is by his nature continually articulate. He fills the world with his voice. We simply must listen. 
mean, working in ministry, I've met so many amazing people. And so often I, I meet people who, who feel like they have heard this very direct message from God, that God has spoken to them plainly and clearly, this, this is the message. And for me, those moments are pretty few and far between. Ah, but when we listen, when we hear that voice of God, how it changes our lives. The same Holy Spirit that filled Elizabeth in today's scripture, that Holy Spirit dwells in us. There are, are signs all around us of this God at work. And when we start doubting, doubting that this God wants to speak to us, we, we miss it. God wants to speak to you. God wants to speak through you. This is a, a scripture that reminds us there is no place, no situation, and no person who is insignificant to God. I don't care who you are. I, I don't care what you've done. I don't care what talents you have or, or feel like you don't have. God wants you. <laughs> He has a plan to use you to help change the world. I get it. Sometimes it, it's hard <laughs> to see those subtle signs. And, and sometimes they feel completely insignificant. But I promise God is speaking. If we just keep listening, if we, if we just keep looking for the signs... The other lesson that, that I think is so important is this text is the importance of mentors. One of my seminary professors always said, there are only two ways to gain wisdom, mistakes and mentors. <laughs> Trust me, the second one is much easier than the first. <laughs> I think Mary knew that. When life felt so overwhelming, she made a beeline for Elizabeth. Her cousin, her, her relative, her friend, her mentor. Oh, how valuable those people are. Sometimes what draws us together is having common experiences. And maybe that's part of what happened in today's text. Two women in very different Stages of life, both pregnant at the same time. But sometimes we're close to people because they're family. <laughs> and I know how important those relationships are. But I'm also keenly aware that not everyone has a family support system like Mary did. I think that's why the church is so important. Because we, we are meant to be family as well. As the body of Christ, we are called to support one another. We're here to be friends and support systems and mentors to the people in the pews around us. I think every one of us should have a spiritual mentor we look up to and someone we're mentoring. I know it's not always easy to find those people. That's why I am so adamant about the need for small groups. Yes, we can learn something good from the studies that we're going through, but when it's done well, those small groups become your lifeline when the storms of life rage. My question, my, my challenge, who is that person in your life? Who's the person you turn to when everything feels overwhelming? Yes, my wife is, is maybe that first person for me. 
but we all have to have people beyond our family as well. Maybe just important is the question, who are you mentoring? Now the church, it's so much more than a building. So much more than a worship service. And the Christmas story, it it is about so much more than just a baby in a manger. I know our world looks very different than it did on that first Christmas. But our God is still the same. And our mission is the same as well. What if... What if this Christmas is a chance for revival? Revival in our own lives, in in our church, in our community. Recognizing that God uses so many incredible people in his story. I mean, Jesus came to change the world But it was John the Baptist who started the revival. Joseph and Mary take center stage in the nativity scene, but the story begins with Zechariah and Elizabeth. God sends unexpected messages through the most unlikely heroes. And I'm convinced that's still true for us. God has a miracle, a a plan for you. Uh, Christmas, it's not just about what happened. It's a reminder that God, God works through unlikely heroes like Elizabeth, like you and me. And that, that is something worth celebrating all the time. Amen? Would you pray with me? Loving and gracious God, we are so thankful for all that you have given us. We are so thankful for the ways that you have called us to serve in this incredible story of yours. Help us, God, to find those mentors in our lives and and to be those mentors to others. Help us to reach out beyond our own family to this family of Christ so that together we we can still do amazing things for you. In your name we ask it. Amen.